looking welcome to church. Hi, we're the Lin family. It's so nice to see you today. Ooh. Hope you have a blessed yeah. service. There's a Bye. 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 Hi, SP. Um, welcome to service. I hope you have a, a great day. Thank you. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. And bye. Say bye. Good morning, Solomon's Porch. Merry Christmas. We're so glad you could join us from your home or uh, wherever you are gathered to watch the service together. I hope that you're having a great start to your Sunday. Why don't we take a moment? Uh, as I always say, let's get out, of, get out of our bed. Let's not get too um, casual, right? Like P. Sam uh, shared with us two, uh, two weeks ago, I think. Let's not get too casual just because we're at home, but let's prepare our heart and our mind to worship and honor and um, yeah, meet with our God. He is a holy God. He is a holy God. Yes, He calls us His friend, but that doesn't mean we just treat Him um, nonchalantly. All right, so let's just go before God. Let's uh, prepare our hearts to really honor and glorify Him. Uh, so let's take a moment. I just want to give you just a minute to quiet your, your heart and pray, prepare your heart to meet with Him. Let's do that right now. Let's recite the Apostles' Creed together as a confession of our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty, from which he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy universal church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let's pray. God, we thank you. We thank you for this morning. We thank you that you have um, woken us up and we're gathered together as a church to honor you, to worship you, to adore you. We also thank you for this Christmas season, God, that we can think about the birth of our Savior, Lord Jesus Christ. The fact that the Savior of the world has come, God, and how we, how we need you, Lord Jesus, to be our Savior. And uh, we want to take time to meditate on that and to thank you for that and to uh, glorify you for that. So Holy Spirit, we just pray that you would uh, pour out, uh, yeah, pour out the fullness of the Holy Spirit into our hearts right here and also every heart, every person that is joining us for the live stream, that you would fill them up and give them a real heart of worship, a real sincere heart so that we can honor you rightly. God, you are worthy of our worship and praises. Be with our children as well. I know it can be difficult for them to stay focused, but I pray that something of the Spirit of God would touch their hearts now, that they would be awakened, eyes will be opened to see your glory and to see mm, your love, God. So Lord, we give this time to you. We thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Yeah, we're going to sing uh, a few Christmas songs as well as we do that. Let's not just sing it as a Christmas carol, like just a sing-along. But let's still think about the, the lyrics and really um, be thankful, you know, that Christ, the Savior of the world, has come. And we all need a Savior. We all needed a Savior. We still need a Savior every day because of our sin, our brokenness. 
and he is here he is Emmanuel so let's just um, worship him let's thank him as we sing these songs together Hark the herald angels sing Glory to the newborn King Peace on earth and mercy mild God and sinners reconciled Joyful all ye nations rise Join the triumph of the sky proclaim Christ is born in Bethlehem Hark the herald angels sing Glory to the newborn born to Christ by highest heaven adored Christ the everlasting Lord made in time behold him come offspring of a virgin veiled in flesh the Godhead see hail the incarnate to give and 
answers to this What a beautiful name it is The name of Jesus What a beautiful name it is What a beautiful name it is The name of Jesus Christ my King What a beautiful name it is Nothing compares to this what a beautiful name it is, the name of Jesus. What a beautiful name it is, the name of Jesus. Oh, what a beautiful name it is, the name of Jesus. Rejoice, I say again, rejoice. Those are the words of Paul. And after peace and hope have both been realized, today, on this third Sunday of Advent, we rejoice. Rejoice, I say rejoice, says Paul. And on this third Sunday of Advent, after hope and peace have been realized, today we rejoice in the name of the Lord. We rejoice in the coming of the Messiah. And so as we worship today, as we celebrate the coming of the Lord, let us rejoice. Even if it's hard, even if it's boring, even if we're tired, I encourage you all today to rejoice. And so Abba Father, God, we lift up these songs of praise to you as we celebrate the coming of your Messiah, the Messiah, Abba Father, your son, in the form of a baby, Abba Father. Lord, we celebrate this season. We celebrate the coming of your son. And may we do it even when it's hard. May we remember, Abba Father God, what is it that you bring to us through this child? Because that is worth celebrating. So Lord, be with us for the rest of the service as we continue to celebrate the coming of your son. May you bless and receive all of these words that will be said and be sung to you today. We love you in this place. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. Um, hi, my name is Rachel, and it's good to see you again. Uh, welcome to our SP online service. Um, now, I want to first say a welcome to all of you, especially for those of you who are joining us for the first time or you're new to our church. Um, we just want to keep you posted and keep you updated. So if you could just take a moment to scan the QR code on our um, screen, uh, you will be led to a connection card. Take a moment to fill that in after service, and we will stay connected with you uh, to keep you keep you updated in our church, uh, to help you be plugged in, and um, yeah, we'll be praying for you as well. So before we go into our service today, I want to take you through some of our announcements. House church season is taking a break. The break will start tomorrow and the new season will begin January 12, 2021. If you are new to SP and would like to join a house church, we encourage you to begin your search in the new year. Please go to our website to learn more about the house church ministry and the groups you can join. Helping Without Hurting is a discipleship course led by the Outreach Ministry. This six-week course will start on Sunday, January 3rd at 2 p.m. The course is designed to lead those who desire to be a force for good in the world to do so without hurting themselves or the ones they are trying to help. It has a focus towards the poor. The cost will be $200. Please note this will be an online course and GIC is a prerequisite. Find out more information and sign up via the SP website. 
our Christmas service will be on Sunday, December 20th. At this point, it is not certain if we will resume meeting in person, but please keep an eye out for updates on our website and social media pages. In a unique year where most of us won't be traveling this season, we encourage you to invite your friends and family to join the Christmas service for an opportunity to hear the good news of Jesus Christ. Now, please note if you're watching from YouTube, we have added all the links related to our announcements in the video description below. Or you can go to the sp.org slash online to find all of our today's um, service items. Now, it is the favorite time of the service. It is offering time. Yay! So please prepare your hearts to give to the Lord. Uh, refer, please refer to the slide on your screen for details on how to give. Uh, today, Marion Lee from Old Peak Road House Church will be praying for the offering, and Aaron Pan will be sharing a song with us. Good morning, SP. Let's bow our heads and pray. Father God, thank you so much for this beautiful Sunday. And even though we're not together physically, we can still have the opportunity to worship you corporately as a body online. Father, please prepare our hearts as we give to you. I pray that we would be giving generously and willingly, not under compulsion. We pray that the funds will be used wisely according to your will and plan. Lord, we lift up Sam to you. We pray that you would anoint him and use him to preach your mighty word this morning. And Father, prepare our hearts as we receive your message. Help us not be distracted even though we're listening to the message at home. Lord, I lift everything up into your hands. We love you and we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.
Amen, amen. Thank you, Aaron, for that beautiful song and a nice uh, hat as well. It was really lovely. Um, before we get into the word today, I just want to say uh, good morning to everyone. I hope you're having a, a wonderful morning uh, so far, that you're nice and safe and home and attentive and ready to uh, get deeper into the word today. But before then, I just want to congratulate uh, some new parents. We have two more babies uh, this week. Uh, we are on a roll. And so uh, this week, uh, Jessica and Matthias, they welcome in Eliana Sheen. And so uh, she's come into the world. And then Nikki and Jason welcome in their third, a girl, Alicia Emma. And uh, um, it's interesting, uh, a year ago during the Lamb Retreat, Love After Marriage Retreat, uh, apparently Jason had a, um, a dream uh, that they would have another baby. And exactly a year later, uh, little Alicia has come into the world. And so, you know, what an I mean, incredible blessing that our children are. So huge uh, congratulations. Please pray for the mommies, that they will recover well. Uh, let's pray for the daddies as well, even though they don't, they're not that important or as important. Uh, but let's really uh, lift up the families and the babies and, and uh, before the Lord. Okay? Amen. Let us turn our Bibles to Exodus chapter 20, and we're continuing uh, to talk about the idea of alignment, or, or like I said, of realignment. And so Exodus 20, we're going to read from verse 2 to 6. So let's read this. He says, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, <laughs> out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol or any likeness of what is in heaven above or on earth beneath or in the water under the earth. You shall not worship them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children, on the third and the fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing loving kindness to thousands to those who love me and keep my commandments. Amen. And let's pray. Thank you, Lord. We just thank you, God, um, for today. We thank you, Lord, for loving us so much. Uh, we thank you. Uh, Lord, that, that you give us choices, God, to make every single day, and we can choose to love you, or we can choose to love other things, Lord. And today, God, with all of our heart, Lord, we choose you above everything and anything else, Lord. And so, Lord, let that be the resolve, God, of our hearts today. Lord, thank you for the word. Uh, we ask you to speak to us through it, Lord. To that end, we ask you to release the revelatory ministry of the Holy Spirit in this room and all the rooms. Lord, give us an ear to hear and a heart to, rece to receive what the Spirit is saying to each one of us individually and corporately as body. Lord, I humble myself today. I ask that you use me to preach your prophetic word with power and authority. Help me, Lord, not just convey your words, God, but convey your heart. God, we thank you. We love you in this house, Lord. And in Jesus' name, all God's people said, amen. Amen. And so I mentioned a, a few weeks uh, before that I, I really uh, found a really good way of aligning or realigning myself back to the Lord. And it was just this simple phrase, this simple thought, love what God loves and hate what God hates. It's so simple. Love the things that God loves with all of my heart and hate the things that God hates with all of my heart, like a lying tongue, like deceit, like a false witness, like murder, all these things that we talked about a few weeks ago. Last week, we, we, we talked a little bit about Eastern religions and, and Eastern ideas and mysticism and occult practices that God hates. And today I'm going I'm to take a little turn, but before then, um, I, I want to just talk about the, the first four commandments. And um, I just read this in Exodus 20. Uh, in the first four commandments really dictate our relation with God. The next six uh, dictate our relationships with one another. And if you uh, are really more interested, I did a whole series on the Ten Commandments maybe about seven years ago, and you can go online and look up those messages. Uh, I, I thought they were, uh, they were pretty decent. And so, uh, but the first four commandments dictate our relation with God. The first three actually tell us about the way that we should worship God. He says here, you shall have no other gods before me. You shall make no idols. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. And this is important. That this is the con conduct by which we worship God. And the fourth runs alongside of this is remember the Sabbath day and to keep it holy. 
And so this is kind of the idea. So we, we, we're told right off the bat that you shall not have any other gods. If you choose God, if God is your God, then you'll have no other gods, that you will not worship any idols, uh, that, that you will make sure that you do not use the Lord's name in vain or lift his name up to vanity or nothingness, and you should keep the Sabbath day holy because it's, it's holy before the Lord. And so last week I, I mentioned to you a bit that idolatry, remember you choose God, that's, that's what you're saying. Uh, I, I said it way early on, when you say yes to Jesus, it means, it means saying no to many other things. And so in this idea, uh, I want to talk about idolatry just for a mo moment because idolatry is much more than just worshiping false gods. It's more than Buddhism or Hinduism or, or any of the other these isms that are around us. It's much more than that. And I quoted Tim Keller, so I'll quote him again. And this is what Tim Keller says in his book, The Counterfeit Gods. And he says, it is anything, he's talking about idolatry, it is anything more, to you, more important to you than God. Anything that absorbs your heart and imagination more than God. Anything you seek to give you what only God can give. An idol is whatever you look at and say in your heart of hearts, if I have that, then I'll feel my life has meaning. And then I'll know I have value. Then I'll feel significant and secure. An idol is anything so central and essential to your life that should you lose it, your life would hardly would feel hardly worth living. And so he gives us a, a broader definition of what idolatry is. It's anything more important to you than God. And, 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 it's, and it's not like God is some egomaniac and he needs to be so important in our lives, but because God loves us so much, he knows that all these other things will not satisfy us. All these other pursuits, the worship of other gods and, and other different things, they will not satisfy us. It's a road to a dead end. And God offers us something else, this belief in God that brings significance and fulfillment and identity and purpose and joy. So Keller challenges us to think of idolatry a little differently as anything more important to you than God. Frank Viola, a uh, theologian, he says this, and he says, when you peel back the layers of any sin, idolatry is at the heart of it. So you should think about that. If you look at every sin that we commit, if you peel back the layers of sin and you, and you find the heart of it, just think about peeling back an onion, and the heart of it is you'll find really the sin of idolatry. Basically, we love that sin, we love doing that thing more than we have loved God. And so he makes this connection, and we're, and we're making this connection uh, as well today as well. Uh, like I said, last week I mentioned, you know, we, we, are, we are sophisticated people, modern people uh, living in this time, in this modern age of technology and advancement and, and all these different things. And we would not knowingly bow down before an idol, but I asked the question last week, could we do it unknowingly? Can we do this actually out of ignorance and worship false gods or other idols out of ignorance? And, and I think the answer is a resounding yes. Like I mentioned last week, we talked a lot about Eastern occultic uh, religious practices. Today, I want to speak to the Western world. I want to speak to the Western mind. Not, not that the Western mind doesn't believe in all, and do all those Eastern things as well, but I want to talk about idols in the modern Western world. So we'll just go through this. Number one, number one, a huge one is the idol of self. The idol of self. Self-centeredness, self-absorbed, self-actualization, self, 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 self. Our culture is obsessed with self. Uh, I mentioned before in other sermons that uh, when, when I when I try to go out and witness, and I, I try to do that as often as I can, and when I go out, and I, particularly when I talk to a Hong Kong person, you know, a person that's a local Hong Kong person, and I talked about what do you believe, and you know, they, we get in a conversation, they find I'm a pastor, and I ask them, well, what do you, what do you believe in? And the, the resounding consensus from local Hong Kong people is, I believe in myself. I believe in me. You know, and, 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 and I don't, I don't want to go through the whole conversation, but I try to break down uh, that simple idea that, that you cannot depend on yourself. Um, and, 
and so on and so on, but, but I'm not here to talk about this. But the idol of self, the root of this idea is centered on another isism, uh, not isism, ism, that we call humanism. Humanism. Humanism is a belief that human experience and rational thinking provide the only source of knowledge and a moral code to live by. You have to recognize most actually of our modern educational system is humanistic in nature. And so we find that, that this humanism that has infiltrated the thought of academia in the world is really centered on the self. I, I only need myself. I don't need anything else. I don't, I don't need knowledge that's, is, that needs to be revealed from God or anything. It's just me. That, that's that's this, this, this idea of humanism. It's at the root of this idol of self, that we only depend on ourselves. The gospel actually gives us a whole different alternative uh, by which we live our lives. In Luke chapter 9, 23 and 24, Jesus speaking, he says, and he was saying to them all, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny self. Self won't satisfy you. And he says, and take up his cross daily and follow me, for whoever wishes to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake, he is the one who will save it. Our call as followers of Christ is to deny self. We focus on God and others instead. Right? This was embodied primarily in Jesus the Christ. In Philippians chapter 2, verse 3 to 4, um, he, and 3 to 5 actually, he says, do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourselves. He says, do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. Have this attitude in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. And he offers us a different way to live our life that can break us and takes us away from the idol of self. Now, you're going to recognize this message is, is for SPers. This, I mean, this, this series of messages is for SPers. I'm not, I'm not trying to make an apologetic statement uh, uh, for any of these things. I'm talking to ways that, that SPers, we as church members, could be, could be worshiping other idols in our, in our lives uh, simply out of ignorance. And so that, that's, that's the basis, okay? And so if you're expecting a huge apologetic, Listen, I don't have enough time to do that in one sermon, by the way. And, and so, but, but that's not really the point here. I'm just trying to protect the house in a way. As, a, as your pastor, trying to lead us away from certain machinations in our mind, our thinking, that, that bring us to ignorantly worshiping idols or bowing down to idols or being involved in some sort of idolatry in that way. And so the first one is the idol of self. The second one that I thought about is the idol of materialism, or we can also call consumerism. The Id idol of materialism and consumerism. Uh, this is the mindset of continual pursuit of material goods and the accumulation of worldly possessions. Instead of receiving joy and contentment from God, we pursue possessions to give us what only God can give. We, we have a hole, we, we have a, a vacuum in our heart that longs for something, meaning, purpose, whatever it may be, but we try to satisfy that with possessions. This is what we call, uh, think about as materialism or consumerism. First Timothy, the Bible offers us a, a very different way of looking at this. In First Timothy 6, 7, he wants us, uh, uh, Paul wants us to have a good relationship with the world around us. And look what he says. He says, for we have brought nothing into the world. This is First Timothy 6, 7. We have brought nothing into the world, so we cannot take anything out of it either. And we understand some, a, a bit of the folly of materialism and accumulation. I mean, you spend your whole life accumulating all these things, you die, and then it becomes someone else's stuff. You know what I mean? I mean, you spend your whole life, uh, you know, getting stuff, and then you die, and it becomes someone else's stuff. What, what's the point of all this? See, the gospel calls us to learn the art of contentment. It's very different. We find our satisfaction not in the new toy or the new thing or the new purse, the new car, the new watch, or whatever it may be, but we find our satisfaction in Christ and in Christ 
alone. Actually, if you look at this, throughout the New Testament, if, if you see this, we actually see the reverse of materialism. Instead of uh, the early Christians hoarding and collecting, we actually see them uh, in the New Testament giving away possessions or selling them to benefit other people. Is the antithesis. Why? Because God knows that these things will not satisfy you. And, 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 and we've all been through this. I mean, how many times have you longed for something and you calculated, you online shopped, I mean, you, you did price comparisons, you, you did everything, and you finally received it, you finally got it. I mean, it was fun for a while, but come on, let's be honest. And then you had to find the next new thing. It was, it was the next pursuit because inherent, it, these things don't satisfy only God does, brothers and sisters. And let the Holy Spirit speak to you if you are struggling with materialism. Number three, kind of tied into materialism, but it's a little bit different, is the idol of money, or we could say the idol of wealth. It's very similar to materialism because many times the end goal of the pursuit of money or wealth is to purchase worldly goods. And so that's part of it. But the accumulation of wealth is a pursuit all of its own. And we've seen in, in many cases around the world, family, friends, relationships of all kinds are sacrificed at the altar of money. It, it's, it's, it's so uh, uh, disastrous of what this happens. Ecclesiastes, the Bible tells us in Ecclesiastes 5.10, Solomon says, he who loves money will not be satisfied with money, nor he who loves abundance with its income. You'll never be satisfied by these things. And that's why the Lord tells us, beware of the spirit of mammon. To be ruled by the pursuit of wealth and money is in the Bible the pursuit or the worship of mammon. Mammon is that spirit that governs the areas of wealth and finances that are not submitted to God. And so the best thing that you can do, brothers and sisters, is really simply to submit your wealth, submit your finances, submit these things to the Lord so that the, the snare of the spirit of mammon will not enter in. You know, the Bible tells us that the love of money is the root of all evil. That's such an astounding statement when we think about it. I mean, there's so much evil, but if you think at the heart of it, it's not money, it's the love of money, it's the greed. It, it, it's, 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 um, uh, it's, it's this mammon that we're talking about, this spirit that governs these areas, and it's the root of all evil and so we need to stay away from it and so the Lord offers us a, um, an alternative which he calls generosity and it breaks the spirit of mammon I talked on it so much in the past I, I, I don't want to repeat things here in this place I mean there, there are so many other things in our modern culture um, that, that I can name, but, but just for time's sake, and, and I, I think they're, they're quite self-explanatory, and so I don't, I don't need to go on and on and talking about this, but I think another idol of our day and age is social media, particularly your mobile phones. I mean, uh, you know, studies have shown that mobile phones uh, disconnect us to, to the world, uh, it hinders relationships and all these things, but yet we still can't put these phones and our social media down, and it's become a huge idol in that way. Technology. You know, another one, uh, and, and that we put, in also this idea of technology and, and modern advances and all these things are also tied in some way to humanism. And then the other one uh, is celebrity culture, that, that in this world, and I don't know how this happened, uh, that all of a sudden, you know, celebrities, and, and a lot of it is because of social media, and all, now people are famous for just being famous. Uh, you know, I mean, um, what have the Kardashians done, you know, for the world? I mean, they're just famous for being, I, I don't want to disparage, you know, a family, a group of people, but, you know, just, I'm just talking, okay? Uh, but it's, it's this, I mean, crazy celebrity culture that we live in. And, and now, you know, my kids are introducing me to the world of influencers. You know, I'm like, who are these people? Oh, they're influencers. Well, what does that mean? What do they influence? 
You know, and so on. And, and as, as an older person, I just, I just don't understand that. You know, they get thousands of, of dollars for posting certain things. And so other people, because of the celebrity culture, will buy those things. And I, I just think this, that's so insane. It, I mean, it, it's, it's really crazy when you think about this. But I think that's an idol in our culture. And incidentally, that's not just in the world culture. I think that could also be very prevalent and present in the Christian culture as well. And, and, and we, we idolize pastors and leaders and theologians and thinkers and stuff. And I, I, first, number one, I don't think they want to be idolized, number one. You know, and, and number two, it, that doesn't really, doesn't really honor God because only he's the one that we should look to in that way. But the last one that I want to talk about, this, which is, this is actually point four, uh, the last one here, and I want to spend a little bit of time with this because I, I feel like, in, in, like something that really trips us up in our modern age is science, science, okay? So let me preface all this by saying, I believe in science, okay? You know, I'm not, I'm not like one of those flat earthers or, you know, all, all these kind of, that's, I, I believe sci science is good. I believe in doctors. I believe in medicine, right? So all the scientists at our church, you know, I love you and I believe in you. I believe in all that stuff. I, 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 I'm gonna take medicine. I see the doctor, you know, if I, I went to see two doctors this week, right, uh, for some bodily ailments that, that I'm having. And so I'm, I'm, I'm good with that. But I want to talk about science as a philosophy, or science really in many ways as a religion, um, uh, particularly um, uh, if, if we can call it kind of um, uh, uh, macroevolution, or, or oh, there's a lot of different phrases for this. And so um, let me just share something before we kick off into this. A renowned neurosurgeon, Ben Carson, uh, who, who's now in uh, the cabinet in the United States, but, but before that, I mean, he was a famous, famous neurosurgeon. And but Ben Carson was being interviewed um, and was in a press conference, and he was challenged on his views on evolution and Darwin. Because as a, a believer, he obviously doesn't believe in, in, in that. And he, this is how he replied. He replied, I'm not going to denigrate you because of your faith. You shouldn't denigrate me for mine. And Ben Carson, what he was saying was he, was, he was giving really this social commentary that science, particularly evolution, uh, macroevolutionary thought and these type of things, has become a religion and a faith and a philosophy all unto its own. Uh, Stanley Fish, a literary theorist, he was chastising atheists, notably Richard Dawkins. And, and, and he, he wrote this. He said, science requires faith too before it can have reasons. He, described, he then went on to describe those who don't accept evolution as belonging to a different faith community. And he was just being honest with where modern science has really brought about this kind of idea and this kind of thinking. Modern science, the scientific world, would have us believe that, that religion and science are arch enemies of one another. Like I said, I believe in science. I mean, I, I, I believe that, that, if, if that, that you know, I cannot fly, I believe if that I jump off a building, it's called the theory, you know, theory of gravity, that I will die. It's not a theory, it's the law of gravity, okay? I'm going to die. At least break my legs or something. I mean, obviously, we, we understand scientific principles, and we believe in these things. But like I said, but in this way, but, but, but it's not a belief system. Brothers and sisters, science is a method. Say that. Turn to your neighbor, whoever is at home, if you're by yourself, Put on on the chat. Just say, hey, good looking. Science is a method. Science, okay, science is a method. Let me take a drink. Go ahead. Science is a way to acquire knowledge. That's simply what it is. That, that's, that's, that, that's, that, that, that's what it was meant to be for. 
So let me quote this. I, I, obviously, I'm, I'm not a scientist, okay? And so even though I took science in college and, you know, biology and chemistry and, and, and all those type of things, uh, anthropology and, and so on and so forth, um, I would not in any uh, way or form consider myself to be a scientist in any way. So I have to draw from other experts in this field. And one of my favorites is actually uh, a gentleman, Professor John Lennox. John Lennox is Professor Emeritus, Oxford University, renowned mathematician, uh, and a, a, a believer, a very strong believer in, in Jesus Christ. And, he, and, and this is a quote I got. He was debating at Oxford University, part of the Oxford Union, in 2012. Um, and, uh, and this is what he says in, 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 in this talk. And, and I, I will, I will uh, copy all of, of these YouTube clips uh, onto... Um, Somewhere, okay, and you can, you, can, you can get it. Kenny will figure it out, and you can get it, okay? So, sorry. sorry. Um, so John Lennox, this is what he says. It's, it should be on your screen. It says, as we look at the rise of science in the 16th and 17th centuries, Alfred North Whitehead and many others commented that men became scientific because they expected the law of nature, and they expected law of nature because they believed in the lawgiver. So ladies and gentlemen, I'm not ashamed of being both a scientist and a Christian because arguably Christianity gave me my subject. What I'm amazed at is that serious thinkers today continue to ask us to choose between God and science. That's like asking people to choose between uh, uh, Henry, uh, uh, Henry Ford and engineering and the explanation for the motor car. He says, when Newton discovered the law of gravity, Newton didn't say, I have a law. Now, I don't need God anymore. I, 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 I'm at such a, a great debt to Professor Lennox. And today's world, though, would have us believe that science and religion have been at odds with each other from the get-go, but that's not true. If you actually do a cursory study of this, you'll find that most major fields of science were started by believers. Yes, the founders of different fields of study in science were believers. And, and they simply thought that since God was a God of order, our theme, and so he created the universe in, in an orderly fashion, thereby which we can study it. So let me just give you some examples of this, okay? Robert Boyle. Boyle discovered the first gas law, which if you remember you were in school, it was known as Boyle's Law. That's from him. And uh, he, he says this, but, but he's a committed believer, and he said this. He said that a, that, that a deeper understanding of science was a higher glorification of God. Gregor Mendel, the founder of genetics, I don't know if you knew this, but he was an Augustinian abbot. Uh, he was a monk, basically. And in his, in, his, in his own study in pursuit of God, he basically uh, uh, found himself to be the founder of genetics. Isaac Newton, that, that uh, uh, Dr. Jess uh, mentioned a second ago, he is, he is the father of gravity, the law of gravity and motion. Uh, Isaac Newton, and I don't know how, much, how many of us are happy about this, but he invented calculus. I hated calculus. Uh, invented calculus. He built first uh, the reflecting, uh, built the first reflecting telescope, showed sunlight is made out of all the colors of the rainbow. I mean, this guy was probably considered one of the greatest scientists of all time, a solid believer in the Lord. Um, it's interesting that uh, um, uh, Albert Einstein um, he used to carry three, three pictures uh, um, in his wallet and, and, and uh, in his wall, and, and they, were, they were the three uh, basic, the greatest minds for him, and he, he, it was an inspiration. And one was Isaac Newton. I have the other two here. Michael Faraday was the other one. And he discovered electromagnetic induction. Um, uh, Faraday is so famous, uh, he's... Um, uh, the idea of the Faraday constant is named after him, as well as the Faraday effect, the Faraday cage, and the Faraday waves. I know no, I have no idea what these are, but he, he came up with this, and they're all named after him. 
Uh, and he's considered the greatest experimental scientist ever, uh, an incredible believer. Um, the other one that, that uh, Albert Einstein used to uh, hold in very high esteem was James Clerk Maxwell. And his equations unify the forces of electricity and magnetism. Uh, he's considered like the, the founder of the second wave of physics uh, in this way. Uh, Lord Kelvin, another one, uh, this is the whole idea of the Kelvin unit of temperature. All these men were committed believers. And they believed that, that they could study the world that created the world because God created the world in order. I mean, I could go on and on, talk about Pascal, Blaise Pascal and Copernicus, uh, Kepler and Galileo and so on and so forth. And to these men, studying God's creation was an act of worship. Studying God's creation was an act of worship. So what happened? I mean, you, you have this history of science that, that, that just, just really uh, about men of God, women of God, that had a, such a deep commitment to God and knew that God structured the universe in order and so can thus orderly study it. And he came up with all these wonderful ideas and, and uh, 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 established laws and so on and so forth. And they considered this to be an act of worship. Why is science and religious belief now at odds with each other? Let me, let me, let me show you a, a graph, if I, if I can, for a moment. This is a graph of Nobel Prize winners from 1901 uh, to 2000, 100 years. And so when you see this, you'll notice only 10.3% are atheists, agnostic, Free thinkers. Free thinkers are basically people that um, are, don't classify themselves as, as agnostic or atheist, but also uh, don't uh, classify themselves as religious. But only 10.3% of which. And, uh, and incidentally, of these 10.3, most of these numbers arise because of their prominence in literature, which is not necessarily a science. And, and so, so that, that makes it even, even bigger, right? 34%. Uh, particularly that win the Nobel Prize in literature are from this group. So you can see that, that if you actually just pick the sciences, this figure would actually go down quite a bit, but I, I don't have that figure, so I can't give it to you. And so you look at this, all others, 90% were all religious. Isn't that crazy? In fact, 65.4% were Christians. They believe like you and I believe in Jesus the Christ and the virgin birth and he was raised from the dead and all these wonderful truths uh, that, that we'll go to our grave with. An astounding 21.1% were Jewish. Why is that astounding? Because Jewish, uh, Jewishness, uh, the, the, the race in the world population is only 0.02%. That's crazy, right? 0.02% of the world produced 21% of Nobel Prize winners in this way. And, 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 you, and, you, see, and you see this. But why, why the difference? I mean, what happened? You know, that science became the arch enemy of religious thought. I don't know. So there was a, I, I was, something took place here. But remember, you understand, science is a method. Well, I can't say I don't know. I do know, but... In any case, science is a method. It doesn't answer all the questions of the universe. It is not the all in all. Only God is. You know, it's amazing. We're, we're going we're gonna to fast soon. Uh, and uh, we're, we're going to um, uh, uh, go before the Lord and uh, our 21 days. And some people are going to fast longer in these things. And, and I, I've been preaching on fasting for ages before it became popular. It's so popular now. And it's crazy. Back in the days, I would say the Bible, I would share all the things the Bible says about fasting and how wonderful it is and why would God ask us to do something that was going to harm our bodies and so on and so forth. And you didn't believe me. You didn't believe me. But as soon as I said, Dr. So-and-so for some you know, university, uh, usually Harvard or Stanford or Oxford or something, you know, and they basically said the same exact thing that I said as your pastor, all of a sudden, you believe them. It's, 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 I mean, it's interesting that, 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 it, it, that science and scientific thought has become the, the arbiter of truth. And I think that's a problem. 
I think there's a problem. I'm not saying that science is not truthful or, or not, not have elements of truth. I do. But let's, let's think about this. Science is a method. It's not a philosophy. It's not a religion. It doesn't answer all the questions of the universe. It's not the all in all. Only God is. Let me, let me quote this. So what's been happening these days, if, if you're involved in the whole apologetic world and these things, there's been a rise, I would say, in the last 30 years or so, of what they call the new atheists. And, 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 and so, you know, before scientists, uh, they, they, they could say, well, I don't believe in, in God, and, and that was fine. But now you had a whole new brand of scientists, a whole new brand of scholar and thinker that actually now says, well, not only do I don't believe in God, but if you believe in God, you're some kind of idiot. Or you, you, don't, you, you, you cannot be a rational thinker, and so on and so forth. And so this is uh, Christopher Hitchens, uh, Sam Harris, um, uh, 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 Richard Dawkins. Uh, and, you know, and so Richard Dawkins wrote a book called The God Delusion. And, and he writes about this idea that you cannot believe in God. I mean, God is just simply a delusion. And so it, 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 was, it, was, it was so um, uh, um, uh, rhetorically uh, antagonizing uh, to believers that non-believers... I mean, non-Christians, you know, people, non, people that didn't have religious belief, you know, came into the argument and one it was a particular uh, uh, mathematician named David Berlinsky. And David Berlinsky is a secular Jew. I mean, he is Jewish by race, but he's not a believer, doesn't believe in God, any of these things. Um, but he wrote a book called The Devil's Delusion in response to Richard Dawkins' book. Now, remember, this guy is not a believer, um, but he's a, uh, he was he was a, a professor of mathematics at Stanford University. He's, now he writes books, uh, primarily uh, he's, a, he's he's a scholar, he's a, he, part of a think tank, and and this is actually the forward to his book. And if you've ever heard Ravi Zacharias, you probably heard this quote before. But let me uh, quote Berlinsky. He says this. He says, "Has anyone provided a proof of God's inexistence? Not even close. Has quantum cosmology explained the emergence of the universe or why it is here?" Not even close. Have the scientists explained why our universe seems to be fine-tuned to allow for the existence of life? Not even close. Are physicists and biologists willing to believe in anything so long as it's not religious thought? Close enough. Has rationalism in moral thought provided us with an understanding of what is good, what is right, and what is moral? Not close enough. Has secularism in the, in the terrible 20th century been a force for good? not even close to being close? Is there a narrow and oppressive orthodoxy of thought and opinion within the sciences, sciences close enough? Does anything in the sciences or in their philosophy justify the claim that religious belief is irrational? Not even ballpark. The last one. Is scientific atheism a frivolous exercise in intellectual contempt? Dead on. Dead on. Again, here's a secular Jew, a non-believer that is just looking through the scientist, a scientist himself, and saying that science does not answer the questions of the universe. Now, let me, let me share a video here. It's another one of my favorite. Again, it's John Lennox. And here's a video of Lennox. And, uh, um, and it, it, he, he's, he's talking about the idea of God. Particularly, this, the, the thesis of God delusion is that that this God that we believe in that must have a creator. He was created, and that creator is God, and so on and so on. So he deals with this, and he also deals with the mystery of Trinity. And so it's actually a really a great talk. And so here's, here's John Lennox. Let's come to that first question, which has interested me because it's become a great focus recently, um, both in North America and in Britain and in Europe. Everybody's talking about it. I thought I'd left it behind in Russia. And that's the question, who created God? And Dawkins has made it the heart of his book, The God Delusion. I was staggered when I found it there. What I mean about Russia, ladies and gentlemen, is I used to get this all the time in the Academy of Sciences when I was traveling out to Russia in the, in the, in the late 1980s and the early 1990s, you see, that it was almost the first question. If you believe that God created the universe, then logically you've got to ask the question, who created God? And then you have to ask, who created the God that created the God that created the God that created the God that created God? And so on, ad infinitum. And that was the end of God, of course. And that's exactly what Dawkins says in The God Delusion. Well, let's analyze it for a moment. 
who created God? If you ask that question, it shows you've immediately categorized God as created. So you're talking about a created God. Now you imagine if Richard Dawkins had written a book called The Created God's Delusion. I don't think many people would have bought it. (laughs) <laughs> because I don't need him to tell me that created gods are a delusion. We usually call them idols, incidentally. But you see, this question <laughs> this, this, this question is extremely interesting because it's an illustration of a question that already rules out the explanation that's most likely to be true. Because the Christian claim is that God wasn't created. So if God was uncreated, in the beginning was the Word, and I'm coming to your three and one now, and I'm bringing it in obliquely, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He already was. So the central Christian claim is, and in Judaism and Islam, of course, equally, is that God is eternal. So the question, by definition, doesn't even apply to him. And that's immensely important. The only way you can get anything out of it, then, in the negative sense, is to assume that everything is in the category of the created. But that's just begging the original question. And the Greeks were interested in it. And that's why John's Gospel starts with those words. In the beginning, the word already was. And then it says, all things came to be through him. The Greeks were interested in the question of two categories. The things that came to be, the created things, and the things that already were. And the the question resolves down to this. Is there a thing or a being that never came to be? And that is the Christian claim. And he's called God. But there's a little codicil to this, you see. Richard Dawkins, and I had a debate with him on this very topic in Oxford, And uh, I said to him, Richard, you say that who created God is a legitimate question. I don't think it is. But let me assume now that it is. You believe that the universe created you. So I beg leave now to ask you, using your own question, who created your creator? I'm waiting still for the answer. (laughs) So that's the first point. Very briefly to the second point. God is three in one. Is it a mystery? Yes, it is. And am I allowed to tell a little story? Yeah, a although very I think we point. should we yeah, want yeah, to get to move it on. Yeah. Okay. But do tell the story. Yeah, like yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I was talking to uh, about a thousand scientists, and a man came up to me afterwards, a uh, physicist, and he said, that was very interesting, all that talk about God, but he said, do you know, I detect you're a Christian. And I said, you're... <laughs> Very astute gentleman. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's what I said. I said, you're pretty sharp. And he said, uh, he said, come off it, he said. Now look, as a Christian, you're obliged to believe that God is a triunity. That Jesus was God and man. And he said, now, come on, you're a mathematician at Oxford. This is absurd. Can you explain it to me? Well, I said, can I ask you a question first? He said, sure. So I said, tell me, what is consciousness? And he thought for a second, and then he said, I don't know. I said, that's okay. Let me try an easier one. What is energy? Well, he said, I'm a physicist. I can measure energy. I could use it. I said, you know, that's not my question. What is it? He said, I don't know. Oh, I said, that's very interesting. You don't know. Tell me, I said, uh, do you believe in consciousness? Yes, he said. Do you believe in energy? Yes, he said. So I said, you believe in these two things, you don't know what they are. I said, should I write you off as an intellectual? (laughs) And he said, please don't. And I said, but that's exactly what you were going to do with me five minutes ago. Now I said, if you don't know what energy is, and nobody does, and if you don't believe that, you physicists, read Richard Feynman. (laughs) If you don't know what energy is, don't be surprised if energy, light, gravity, 
and consciousness are a mystery. Don't be surprised if you're going to get an element of this in God. You're bound to get it. But now I pushed him a bit further, you see. And I said, why do you believe in these things if you don't know what they are? And that was a bit difficult. So being a kind chap, I tried to help him out. And I said, um, <laughs> you believe in these things because of their explanatory power as concepts. And he said, that's exactly right. And I said, look, of course I can't explain to you how God became human. But I said, it's the only explanation that makes sense of the evidence as I see it. Now I said, I've got a simple analogy that might help you. It's a very low-level analogy, but at least it's been... Amen. Thank you, Dr. Lennox. Right? That was amazing. Brothers and sisters, science and religious belief are not incompatible. Uh, th just because you believe in God doesn't mean you're some kind of idiot. Right? or that you're not a rational person, uh, as explained here by Dr. Lennox. So you got to understand, when you look at the Bible, the Bible is actually full of scientific ideas before its time. I, I'll, just, I'll just throw a few out there. The Earth's free float in space, Job 26.7, 2,800 years before it was discovered in science. The Earth is round, Isaiah 40.22, 23 or 2,700 years before. The first law of thermodynamics, Genesis 2.1. The second law of thermodynamics, Psalm 102, 25 to 26. The hydro uh, hydrologic cycle of Amos 9.6. Blood as a source of life, Leviticus 17.11. All these, and, and there, there's actually so much more. I, I, could, I, could, I could go on for weeks talking about the science in the Bible, all thousands of years before scientists figured it out. The, the science in the Bible, science and religion, they, they are compatible. And just because you believe in God, and, and, and it's mysterious, and, and, but you may not be able to explain or understand this, but like Dr. Lennox said, but we believe because we've seen the effects of it in our lives. And it doesn't mean that you're not a rational person. You know, I'm afraid that, that we've, we've categorized science and scientific thought as something that's far above and beyond. In fact, that's the only truth, even in the church. And we have to be very, very careful of that and make sure that that's not something that we idolize or that becomes an idol in our life today. I mean, I, I feel so bad because there's so much information and there, there's so much richness even on this simple topic. If you're, if you're interested, I did a Bible study, I think maybe 15 years ago, uh, I think it was about seven weeks or so, talking about science and the Bible and these things. And I'll, I'll try to dig up those notes uh, somewhere and put it online or something uh, for us. Right? Science is a method. That's what it is. It's a way of acquiring knowledge and it should not be worshipped at all. Um, uh, and so, brothers and sisters, you know, let the Holy Spirit speak to you. If any of these idols or could be potential idols, and science in of itself is not an idol, but we can make it an idol. And so in that same way, if we've made any of these things idol, like, like wealth is, is not an idol, but we make it an idol. Possessions are not idol, but we make it an idol and these type of things. Then let the Holy Spirit really speak to you uh, and let the Holy Spirit really press upon you the need for repentance uh, and the need for clear thinking and thought to make sure that only God will have no other gods before him. It's interesting, Dr. Lennox was saying that the idea of the created gods, and he says, we call those idols. That's what we're talking about. These are basically gods that we create, and we ought not to do that. So as the worship team leads us uh, in a song, let's just meditate on this truth. God hates idolatry. Religious ones, but particularly man-made ones. And let's just really honestly assess ourselves before the Lord today. Well, let's pray together. Let's worship. Turn our eyes from evil things. 
say that like I said because he's some egomaniac and he has to be the center of attention for everyone he says that because he's the creator of this universe he's a creator of you and of me and so and because he created us he believes that there is a way that we live our life and if we can bring our lives into his order that's what brings meaning and significance that's when these things of self or of loving ourselves, which is good, you should love yourself. And, and the idea of wealth and science and all these things where these things don't destroy us. When they become the centerpiece, that's what happens. And God says, no, he must be 
because He created the universe. He knows how the universe works. And this is how it works best, that He is God and He is Lord of our lives. And so just as a reflection right now, I just want to just encourage you just to probe into your life and and just ask, Lord, what are the idols in my life? What are the created gods that are bringing disorder into my life? Maybe our relationship with wealth or self or material things or even what I talk about today is science. Let the Holy Spirit speak to you. Those things are given to us for our enjoyment and for our good. Let's not make them an idol and thereby ruin us through it. Let's pray together. pray together father we humbly come before you god and we ask for your forgiveness lord that we have worshiped idols other gods we have placed things god like k i t i m keller says above you we ask for your forgiveness you are a god of order you created the universe you created each one of us with a divine purpose to have meaning and life lord And God, when we place other things other than you there, Lord, life doesn't work. It gets fragmented. It gets painful. And so, Lord, we want to place you and only you alone. You are the most high God, Elohim, and we place you in the highest place. And nothing else competes with you. We thank you, God. Would you watch over us, Lord? God, and just put, God, a deep, deep longing and desire in our hearts as followers of Christ, Lord, as members of SP, Lord, to love you and you alone, God. Watch over us, Lord. We thank you, Lord. We love you. We bless you. Now the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Shalom. from this day forever in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen, amen. Thank you for joining us online. Uh, I hope that you can, this can continue to further uh, deeper discussions about faith and science or any of the other things that we talked about. I have a wonderful, wonderful rest of your Sabbath day. Let's continue to keep it holy uh, before the Lord and enjoy your time. Uh, If you need any prayer or anything uh, in particular, please go to one of the rooms uh, and one of our well ministers would gladly and lovingly pray for you today. God bless you. Enjoy the rest of your week. Let's stay safe and let's continue to pray for our city. God bless you guys. Bye-bye.